Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Charlie Panky with Sierra Rick Magazine and Sierra Rick Now Podcast. Thank you for joining us again today, wherever you're at. We hope the Sierra is within your sights and that you have great plans for the 4th of July weekend coming up. Uh, we are excited to be back with you today after a week of backpacking in Sequoia and back at the office uh, getting ready for our summer plans. And we are really thrilled today to bring our guest to you today. Uh, you've probably heard of the organization Clean Up the Lake. Uh, and I'm lucky enough here to have the director and president of that organization, Colin. It's Colin West, right? Correct. Right. right? Uh, with us. So, Colin, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Charlie. Excited to chat to you. Very good. Hey, we've been following your guys' operation, obviously, since you guys started in Tahoe. Wait, is that five years ago now? How long has it been since you guys have been done Tahoe? Yeah, time goes quick. Um, yes. Five years ago, I, I founded the organization back in summer of 2018 and, and really took about a year or so to get you know through the paperwork and get started. Um, and then five years goes quick. <laughs> That's that, 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 that it is. A, I mean, this is our 10th anniversary here at CREC Magazine. So I understand that completely. I feel like I just started yesterday a little bit. So, but uh, so five years ago, you have this idea that the lakes are dirty in a different way than we're seeing it's, it's kind of you know how i remember thinking of it how'd that come about in your mind and where, where'd that come from yeah so you know if you rewind five five years ago i was in the midst of actually running a film and television company and i enjoyed what i did you know it was actually kind of travel and wine focused uh ironically weird Weirdly, but um, I was going around the world shooting wine documentaries and documentaries on the island of Sicily, all these things. It was good fun, but I was a bit stressed out, um, you know, was doing things for different companies and wine brands. And it was wonderful. You know, I had even studied wine. It was, it was great. But I kind of was looking at the work I was doing and feeling like I could do something better for the planet as well. I want to give back somehow didn't know how at that point in time. And I was down in Central America. I'm um, in Belize on Ambergris okay. Key and Key Cocker. And I just saw the, you know, gross amounts of plastic that were washing up on the beaches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'd walk through a resort and it looks clean. And then you hit an unowned parcel of land between a couple of resorts and it's 10, 12 feet deep in plastic on the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And so I just, my brain started firing and I started having some ideas like on the downtime, what I could do. And I went home and I started a, the 501c3 that is legally called Clean Up the Keys after those oh. two lo locations. Um, and I set up a DBA or doing business as Clean Up the Lake and, you know, and began also doing some cleanups in Tahoe. But when I started that, I was like, ah, you know, it's important to be active in your own backyard. But oh, my gosh, look <laughs> at Tahoe comparatively to to Central America. It doesn't compare. And, you know, yeah. that that is true on some regards. However, when you look you know, deeper figuratively and literally um, yep. underneath the surface of the water and, and get to know the, you know, the dynamics of waste management and litter in the Tahoe mm -hmm. community, you know, it was out of hand. And so, uh, you know, I realized the problem was much bigger than I ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, with a friend kind of began looking under the surface more and seeing litter um, just all over our lake bed floor. Every time we would dive in Tahoe, we would see 50 to 75 pounds per diver um, wow. in the 30 to 45 minute dive. And, and it seemed to be widespread in all the locations we went. And so, you know, clean up the lake, even though it was a DBA became the name that, that we really got to be known by and, and mm -hmm. the work that we began doing. That's, that's a fantastic story. I did not know that part of your story. Were you a scuba diver beforehand or is this something that, or, or I don't even know if you actually scuba dive now. I know you have scuba divers, but I assume you've either learned it or it's something that you've, that you've liked beforehand. Yeah. I mean, so like when, when diving came into play, I was actually, um, I was doing those beach cleanups, just being active in my backyard in 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, excuse me, in 2018, actually. And then um, I heard when I did this cleanup in 2018, in August, that some friends of mine that I grew up with actually did a scuba cleanup that same day. And I remember seeing some information or posts about it where mm -hmm. he pulled 40 pounds of trash off the beach in Kings Beach and, you know, with where there's thousands of people. And they went to this remote little cove where there was no one and they pulled 600 pounds out from wow. under the surface. And I was just blown away and I did have my diving certification and so I ended up getting in touch with them and the guy who owned the dive shop that worked with them and supported them 
uh, Matt Munier, a uh, okay. friend of mine who's sadly no longer <laughs> with us, but um, we, we actually went, uh, I went off and began kind of getting out with them more. And so I was mm -hmm. a diver, but I'd probably been diving seven or eight times over like 10 years. So a very inactive diver. I was, I was basically the kind of diver that when they show up to clean up the lake and they want to come out, I'm like, great. <laughs> well, we got some work to do to get you comfortable <laughs> before I let you next to us underwater. So yeah, we'll very stay novice. Ten level, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. Very novice. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm very fascinated because obviously Lake Tahoe is, is extremely clear and beautiful as a tourist or even a local that goes there just to see the beach and swimming the waves a little bit. Um, and I imagine with the boat traffic and we all saw what happened on the 4th of July beaches last year, which they're trying to mitigate quite a bit this year. I imagine that there's a lot of just casual, unfortunate stuff in the lake. You know, the coolers falling off boats, sunglasses, every, you know, all the little pieces, which all add up. But it, with that much trash, there's got to be like more disturbing stuff. Like I'm now envisioning like bags full of garbage, you know, falling down. What are you seeing that type of dumping or, or is it all just a cl collective accumulation of small pieces? Yeah. I mean, it depends. Um, okay. You know, in have we seen some things that look like a bag just thrown off? Yeah, very yeah. sporadically. In five years, I'm I'm sure I you know couldn't even fill a hand with like you know dump garbage bags. Okay, but good. <laughs> is that because and is that because we're diving in the shallows? You know, in in like the zero to twenty five, and if someone's going to intentionally dump off a boat, they're going to go to a deeper part of the lake potentially, you know, potentially, yeah, okay. um, you know, there's, we have some friends that, and, you know, associates in this nonprofit space that, that have an organization called restore the depths and they use rovers to go to areas where we don't, um, with mm -hmm. divers. And so they maybe have seen things like that, but not as much to my knowledge, but I think what you do see, yeah, you do see a lot of those sunglasses, towels, hats, cell phones, things that fall off. But then I have seen like tire dump sites before oh, where you know, it's like 25 different tires thrown off right in front of the beaches and houses of Incline Village, you know, and there's literally 25, 30 tires in one area. And that's not like an accidental tire or two that no. came loose from a ferry boat, you know, not a ferry, but like the big old steamer yeah, or, yeah. or, or the docks. That's an intentional dump site. And you do see like, say five or six different beers that are, you know, same condition, same, you know, year, same brand and one general vicinity and area where you're like, right. someone's just out there drinking and throw off the boat. You know? yeah, and absolutely. so you see signs of dumping, um, that are obviously intentional, but, um, but not, you know, not, not too much like specific straight dump sites in Tahoe. However, we do think we found one in Fallen Leaf now that I think about it. Oh, no, that'd be a bummer. That'd be a bummer. Yeah, but so, yeah, so let's talk about it because that, that's a lot of people, if they don't follow you on a regular basis, which I which really highly encourage, they have great content, yeah. you guys that just stay in touch. But you guys did Tahoe. I think you've done Tahoe a couple of times. You're pretty active continually in Tahoe, right? You did a Fallen Leaf Lake. You've done Donner. Yep. And then this year you guys are heading to Mammoth. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, we'll be going down to clean up Lake Mary. We actually, get, last two days, I just got out of the water at Stampede Reservoir north of Truckee. Oh, Next wow. Okay. We're going to do a similar pilot research on Boca Reservoir and trying to understand, you know, how problematic are they. But mm -hmm. we've already done some pilot research on Lake Mary, um, which did show pretty average to significant signs of litter, um, mm -hmm. enough that we knew a uh, full cleanup was warranted. And so, yeah, we get back down to Mammoth Lakes and the, and we're going to start cleaning up Lake Mary as of the week of July 8th. July 8th. So that's coming up right off the bat. So, so when you guys look at, you know, a pilot program like that, where you've gone and inspected, well, it kind of walk the, the readers through that process. How do you, do these communities reach out to you now and go, Hey, would you come down and inspect our lake or, or because it's kind of your backyard, the Sierra, are you just kind of pinpointing going, Hey, I know a lot of people use this lake. Let's go check it out. I mean, how, how do you guys come up with that process? Kind of both. Yeah. I mean, uh, the majority are like self, self discovered, self selected really. Okay. And we, you know, it's, I went on a trip in 2021 in April and went around to Lake Almanor, June Lake, Fallen Leaf Lake, um, all the way down to, let's see, we did Crowley. Um, okay. We did Big Bear. We went to Big Bear, but weren't allowed to dive. Didn't know that until we got there. And then oh, wow. uh, Crowley. <laughs> and then Crowley. Sorry. And then uh, Lake Havasu in Arizona. Okay. 
And so, and those were just trying to see it. And then through that, those pi pilot research dives, you know, fast, fo fast forward a few years, we've hit and cleaned June Lake a few different times. That was very mm -hmm. problematic. Um, one of the dirtier lakes we've ever seen. And really? Okay. The, the cleaner now, thankfully, yeah, but thankfully. definitely it was, and still, still needs a little bit of work, but, but, um, better, way better than it was. And then, um, you know, also fallen leaf lake. And so through those pilot research dives or those first year projects, we'll look at them for aquatic invasive species presence for, uh, submerged litter presence. And then we'll kind of be able to create a basis, you know, should we expend further funding, further time and resources at this lake, or is it likely better put somewhere else? And, you. um, you know, stampede reservoir yesterday, for instance, mm -hmm. almost pristine, like way cleaner than we ever could have mm -hmm. imagined. Interesting. Uh, would have, yeah. I would have thought it was relatively dirty. There's a decent amount of boats and a lot of fishing. Mm -hmm. Um, but apart from the odd snagged fishing line and debris, there wasn't much and there's not a lot of like bottom vegetation or too big of rocks and things. So I don't yep. think fishing line is snagged as much as it is in say like George, where we found loads, 3000 loads plus. Yep. Um, but, but yeah, so it's, it's, um, you never really know what you're going to find until you get under the surface. And sometimes it looks as great as Stampede did yesterday. Other times it's, you know, one of the dirtiest lakes we'd seen, like when we did research on June Lake. Right. Okay. And, and that in June, like, again, another one is like the, from the top looks, looks amazing, right? It's all visual. Right. You know why people are on it, the kayaks and the, the boards and everything that are out there. So it's pretty cool. So we, I, I, I followed the program just enough to be dangerous probably here. So let's, let's okay. take readers through what does a cleanup week look like from that, from a staffing aspect and then a volunteer aspect, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great question. So at our organization, we have typically between like four and seven employees. We have a little fluctuation at the moment. So if listeners are interested, they can reach out. We'll be hiring a little bit later this summer. Okay. Um, but yeah, typically between four to seven staff. And, and at that level, we, you know, as a staff, we're working 40 hours, you know, clocking, clocking our time typically in the office or in preparation or breakdown to clean up. Okay. Um, and so that's the task. I actually never require employees to go out on cleanup. They can if they'd like, but they don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and then what they what they're responsible for, what we as a staff are responsible for, are setting up these volunteer um, events and bringing out whatever equipment they need, making sure that the people have been vetted and that they're experienced and knowledgeable enough to do the roles that they're wanting to do, be that um a boat captain jet ski captain a kayaker a snorkeler a deeper free diver or a scuba diver and if they're you know if they have that background experience or certifications to fulfill the position we'll, we'll task them in it and if they don't we might funnel them into our environmental dive center that's located in incline village where today i'm actually having a little sit down with different uh scuba instructors and dive masters who run the classes to train people. So okay. we have those abilities to, to further train those novice divers like I was when I started cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, great, actually, right? You know, yeah. expand that, that base of people who can help, so. Exactly, and that's that's our point, kind of create a little army of conservation divers to protect the environment. And um, and so once, we're, once our staff is working on that vetting, we'll kind of schedule cleanup days, and we usually pick the schedule on Monday of that week. And okay. many people are like, oh, well, I'm coming from here out of town. And we're like, you know, travel here at your own risk to be involved because Monday morning we might look and there's 25 or 30 mile an hour winds or a storm's blowing in or there's signs of lightning or smoke from forest fires these right. days. Like there's numerous reasons that we may not be able to get out on the water. And so mm -hmm. if we can't get out on the water, um, a lot of our staff will focus on either the reporting and analysis parts of projects or the mm -hmm. planning for bigger projects that we may have to do and, and or operational things from government compliance and, and whatever. So that's that, the yeah. kind of staffing. And then the volunteers will meet us on our cleanup days at whatever lake we're active on, uh, where we have all those positions that I was saying, boat drivers, jet ski, yep. kayakers, snorkelers, scuba divers. And, you know, we'll come together, we'll do the safety briefings each morning, we'll kind of get everyone outfitted in their equipment, and we'll get out and we'll do two full on cleanups. And then happy to run you through whenever you want on kind of how those teams work as well. But that's yeah. kind of 
the flow of the week, if you will, and, and lots of breakdown, litter analysis um, and categorization for the scientific um, analysis of the issue um, post cleanup. But that, that's, that, that's the part I would like to jump to next. I've watched that. Do you do that on site or do you guys haul all that back to your incline for because you have systems here that are easy to do, easier to do that? Correct. Yeah, we, we haul it all back in wow. a, a nice little trash trailer that we've spray had an artist spray paint some of us doing cleanup on the side. Oh, really? I, didn't, I haven't seen that trailer drive around. Oh, I'll have to see it driving around. It's a bit rustic and an old covered trailer that we actually got in the peak of the pandemic where everyone bought out all the covered trailers to move to the forest. And okay, so like, yep. we had to drive 10 hours away to find some used covered trailer. <laughs> and it's, you know, we paid what you would have for a brand new one now, but it was, but it does the job and we're all about, you know, kind of not needing more, more products. So we're, we're keeping hold of it, but very good. Um, yeah, we tow we, in that trailer, we tow it all back to our office at Incline Village, our environmental dive center there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then our data management coordinator, one of our employees will basically take those, take the litter from that trailer that is already been organized per dive, right? So we'll yeah. have, you know, dive 1.1, 1 .1, um, SR, like day one, dive one stampede reservoir and yeah. then we'll probably also have you know two point dive 2.2 br boca reservoir and there'll be like four six different things in there be, sorry there'll be eight different dives and bags that have eight different labels on it okay. and our data management coordinator and a team of volunteers who the community just comes to help her she runs it they set mm -hmm. out three different tarps with about 83 to 90 different categories mm -hmm. um that cover foam plastic plastic rubber um, cloth wood um, other different categories where um, they'll take all of those eight different knives and one dive at a time from you know the first dive of day one at stampede they'll organize it into 83 categories photograph way file all that away in spreadsheets and the photos go in folders so that mm -hmm. we can revisit what the litter was later if needed and then they'll do that for dive two on day one, dive one on day two, dive two on day two, move to Boca Reservoir, day one, dive one. And they'll reorganize each dive on those 83 to 90 categories and kind of take that into spreadsheets and folders where we work with environmental scientists to better understand what are, where is all this litter coming from? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what areas might be showing bigger signs of fishing debris or construction or, you know, recreational debris and people drinking too much beer in one spot so yeah, that exactly. government <laughs> can better regulate, develop policy or infrastructure such as waste receptacles, dumpsters in areas that may need it more. That's fantastic. We, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, um, Kern River uh, Conservancy on and they were talking a little bit about their data research that has now helped them put more trash receptacles and things at campgrounds and development things, which has really helped trash in areas that were just getting destroyed. But they needed that data to show, hey, this is what we're collecting and handing out garbage bags, et cetera. So I, I, I you know, applaud you guys on that and keeping that data because it'd be, it'd be easier to just go collect the garbage and throw it away. It, right? Yeah. It, and, you it go, would. yay, we did it. But now you're actually pr producing stuff to make policy change and life change, hopefully down the road. So, exactly and we right. we bring everyone together we've had two two some we've had litter a litter summit lake tahoe litter summit once a year each year uh, yep. which has been fantastic and so we've done that um last may and again this may um and are looking at kind of early fall next year but we we develop uh we bring in all the different agencies governments nonprofits, people um that kind of have responsibility if you will to this issue in the region and we present a lot of that data others present their data we talk about what the most pressing issues are what solutions okay. exist and what more is needed from you know action to policy to anything and the people in that room can you know can develop infrastructure they can change policy and mm -hmm. so that's like that's our our location for an, an event or summit that we created for the tahoe region to be able to 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 be able to drive change from so after five years i mean have you found that you do have a, like in the tahoe region a voice for things like fourth of july weekend where we now on the on the east shore at least have a lot of policy that's implemented after last year's kind of debacle you know, that, that happened right so it's like do you do you guys have a pretty good communication across the lake and are you guys part of that communication pattern 
Yeah, we're, we're definitely kind of in the discussion with everyone. I think, you know, our organization was out there. Like I had our whole staff and 20 plus volunteers on the beach that day where we were, you know, pushing and cleaning and kind of directing everyone on shore. There was Keep Tahoe Blue had a couple of their employees and, and volunteers out there as well. Um, but we found just chucking everything in the back of our truck and <laughs> trying to it was, right. it was there until the last, it was me and my fiance at the time and one employee with forest service. till the last bag was off the beach. And so we were, we were there a lot kind of in that debacle on Zephyr shores last year, kind of yeah. seeing it through. And, you know, when, when that happened, it was yeah, very sad to see, um, you mm -hmm. know, we used the kind of relationships and everything we had in the media and the press to to do our best to make people aware of that problem yeah, you know yeah. and it's you know a tough conversation do we want to kind of showcase that and normalize you know that this happens in tahoe and people think that's okay because it's not obviously yeah. we speak how much of a problem it is but sometimes they can not really hear the problem and just see that it happens yeah. which is a, a debate versus, you know, driving the awareness. And I think yeah. in this case from last year, I think we did a great job. The league did as well of pushing media out um, to show the problem that occurred that really drove strong awareness. The community was pissed off, you know, that yeah. that could happen um, and really were demanding answers and how the beep, could you make this happen in our community, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, now you are seeing management from, you know, Aramark in, in the Zephyr Shoals area now, which mm -hmm. they they control the resort at Zephyr Cove, but now they're controlling that property over there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think their plans have a direction going that could be glamping, could be other forms of development that yeah. other people in the community are not happy about. And I understand both sides of the coin because... Yeah you see like it's this beautiful wild area of Tahoe that's really close to where I live and I love going there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love not seeing a campground or not seeing something there. Yeah. And that's beautiful to have, but then it comes with the issue that it's not managed and yeah. it can in fact be taken over by irresponsible people and damaged. And so bringing Aramark in does bring resources to, you know, mm -hmm. from infrastructure to like more dumpsters and, garbage cans to human resources, like security details and staff, yeah. um, you know, and equipment and things. And if something happens, so there's yeah. two sides of the coin to look at. It's, it's Absolutely. tough, but it does yeah. help protect the incident from what we saw. And I don't think without that awareness, I don't feel like we would have really you know, had the solutions in place that we do this year, which is good. Yeah, you know, we I work, I volunteered I volunteer at Desolation Wilderness, and we talk about that a lot sometimes. That you know, we go in and clean up fire pits and garbage, and we're always carrying around our shovels and stuff. And and uh, you know, so some part of you go and it, it's great just to get communication out and stay positive. And then other times, you know, there's a, just a segment of the population that go, oh, great, they have people cleaning up, so I'll leave a mess, right? So. We, you, you just gotta have to work through that idiocy that yeah. we see in society a little bit. Um, and, and last year was horrible, but uh, uh, it was good to see our community come together and, and work on it too. That's really good. So hey, we've awesome. only got about seven minutes left. I don't want to take too much of the respectful and you got a lot of things to do. Let's talk about Mammoth one more time here real quick. What, what is the need from an organization? Like when you're going to Mammoth and if our listeners are out there and they're in, the, in that region, how do they, get involved? What, what is volunteerism or helping look like uh, from, from, a, from my standpoint or from a reader standpoint? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I think going, going through to our website and I would say the best way to do it, like we'll have you fill out a volunteer application that's on there. And I think that's good to do. Um, but even more importantly is also probably reaching out by email or phone um, to okay. express some interest in getting involved, just because, as you said, we, we get a lot going on and, and the volunteer applications are are important for us to have because it collects all the information that we need to review. Um, mm -hmm. But it's good to give us a nudge to to say, hey, we want to come out and join you. Um, and with the the volunteer positions that we uh, are looking at out there, like sure, if there's an experienced diver, they're they're welcome to join. But Lake Mary, we're kind of keeping the team to much more highly experienced yeah. divers. Uh, just because visibility is low, risk is higher. So for the scuba aspect, um, we're, we're working with highly experienced divers down there. Um, so if there's people in the area that feel like they dive often and, and you know, have the training needed, definitely reach out. 
Um, and then snorkeling and free divers um, can always reach out. We carry a lot of uh, extra equipment for different sizes for people that want to jump in the water and get wet. And um, okay. what they do is they usually communicate with us. So if we see the, an oil drum that weighs hundreds of pounds that we're not lifting up or putting in a bag, we're going to we're going to flag. We're going to look up to the surface where a free diver is watching us and say we have a non collection item, which is this. Easy to <laughs> ski. And then we say it's a heavy lift. Just, you know, 25 year old likes to raise the roof. So I like, like it. I like it. <laughs> and then if it's a hot spot, we'll do the non collection and then we'll go hot spot or we'll do invasive species. <laughs> you know? gotcha. I or, like all the uh, signals. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Or, or if it's possibly historic, we'll throw it back and we'll say, you know, uh, potentially historic or unknown item that we don't want to touch in case it is an artifact. Yeah, and so right. that they'll see that they report that to service support that we they have an archaeological data software they do. And and that's how we kind of record that. And so reaching out for yeah, scuba free diving kayakers who help keep an eye on scuba divers and snorkelers okay. to keep them safe from other boaters or anyone yep. in the region communicate with fishermen because yep. fishermen may see us coming through and they're like, what the hell are you doing? That's where I'm casting my line. And, <laughs> and we're like, Hey, like we're, it's like, you haven't seen the fishing net nests down here. Have you? They get about <laughs> three to five feet. We removed 3,300 plus lines in Lake George. Where everyone wow. thinks, as a fisherman, I did it. I used to think I'd snag my line on a tr on a log. Log, what yeah. You're, is, you're snagging your line on a line on 500 lines that snag that same line oh. that log, and it turns into this big nest of fishing lures. Like I pulled out one ball that probably had 50 bobbers, like 200 weights, 100 lines, like Crazy. it's just 100 like lures and things. Like you're just snipping yeah. out a beautiful tackle box <laughs> so dang man you know, so we're communicating that to fishermen keeping them aware of what we're doing okay. um and then we have uh yeah boat captain is actually probably one of our biggest needs right now is we need boat captains, boat captains in lake mary uh to help us kind of get get around and, and transport divers and stuff so that there you go and how about like people in the shoreline to, to grab garbage bags from the divers and stuff and just Put them in the trailer. Yeah, you guys accept that kind of stuff. It's, we'll be doing we'll be doing litter categorizations down there. So if people okay. do want to get involved in some of the sorting and categorization, so really kind of analyzing it from a scientific perspective on where this litter is coming from and, and what composes Lake Mary litter, we'll, we will need some sorters as well. Perfect. So if you want to get a hold of it's a clean cleanup the lake dot org, right? Yep, correct. And right? then the so, contact us page has email yep. and phone number there. Perfect, perfect. So we only got a few minutes left. I do have one more question I'll ask before I get to my personal question. So we're going to go a few minutes along here, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, what's the craziest thing you guys have found in the water? Like, you, you know, what's what's like, this, there's got to be a funny story of we found, you know, you know. I don't, yeah, I don't no, know we, <laughs> we have. Um, let's see, there's, you know, some funny, some funny ones, you know, if, if the kids are around earmuffs, but earmuffs. like some adult items next to full beers, next to one of the nude beaches, which some adult toys next to. Full. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, and then we found some, um, we found some, uh, like basically fully loaded, probably murder weapons and things. And, oh, and yeah. Okay. Okay. And, turn those into the police and they're in like black garbage bags tossed off cliff where I believe they said there's other evidence they were seeing in the bag. And, um, you know, that was a whole different angle of story. I wanted to go with you going, you know, there's a lot of stories about Tahoe. <laughs> go on. Oh yeah. And, and we do see a lot of like it, likely artifacts and stuff that we document and leave behind and, and turn over to Shippo. And, um, often that is, you know, like we've seen native American canoes and I won't say where we found one, sure. but, you know, to, so it's preserved for the long run, but hollowed out from pine trees, which are really cool. Beautiful. Um, Model T Ford we found in, uh, in um, what was it? Uh, in Fallen Leaf Lake. Um, wow. Some really old, like, artifact, like, 100-year-old, like, fishing boats in June Lake were pretty cool. So we see some some interesting pieces of history, yeah. um, pieces of parties, and a little criminology <laughs> a little as well. Right. So a little bit of everything. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, hey, Colin, I want to appreciate you being on here today. I ask all my guests the same three questions at the end. Doesn't it's kind of weird because you're a scuba diver, you're not a hiker, and like that. But I'm going to, I'm going to apply them to you here a little bit so we have a little yeah. fun. But I, I, I do want to thank you for being on the show today, uh, well, thank and, you, and uh, hope to, hope people look into the organization a little further and go from there. So here's my three questions for you. Perfect. All right, let's say that you're a long day on the dive. 
Okay. Yep. Or, or okay, so let's take it out of the dive. Let's go to the first question first. Let's say your bag is packed. Yeah. And you're going to head to the Sierra for a day off for Colin. And he's yep. not going to go diving for the lake. Maybe you are diving. Where are you going and what are you doing? That's a good question. Um, so for me, it would be I've got my my cars packed. We've got our, our travel trailer on the back. My wife is there, our two pups, retrievers. And we're usually heading down in the Sierra to our little secret spot for, for morel hunting. And it's, it's near oh, a river. Nice. So, yeah, we love parking up and setting up camp next to the river and, and uh, kind of going out and spending a day or two mushroom hunting, foraging for, for morel mushrooms. Well, I, I can tell you that I was just on a backpacking trip in Sequoia and the ranger told me there was morels. And sure enough, I'm hiking to this lake. He goes, oh, yeah, they're just all over the place. So it was a good, good morel okay. area. Okay. <laughs> Is this your last uh, trip? Last weekend. Yeah, last weekend. Oh, geez. Some late, some late ones. It must have been high elevation. <laughs> high elevation, yes. Very high elevation. And not very very uh, untraveled area. So <laughs> oh, jealous, jealous. Yeah. yeah so well, I'll off air, off air, I'll tell you where it's at. Uh, <laughs> all right. Second question. Uh, after a long day in the water, you're scuba diving or maybe you're out doing real hunting. Uh, favorite uh, food item to either take with you or after after hike meal? Like the like this is the meal I love eating. Oh my gosh. It was, uh, you know, it's going through, it's, uh, it's teas burritos in incline village, you know, oh, I, I've never tried that two days ago, just coming back through, I, I just got married. Um, and so I was gone for the last like three weeks and I hadn't had one and I was tired from diving at stampede reservoir and we came through and I was like, oh my gosh, we can have like that big, beautiful burrito and just <laughs> turf down a little Al Pastor tease burrito from Incline. Um, tease burrito. I'm looking it up. They're not sponsoring this, by the way. I just want to let everybody no, know. But no, they're not. That sounds, that sounds delicious. That sounds delicious. Stolen Colin's heart. It's uh, Mexican food is definitely my favorite, my favorite dish, um, you know, kind of whether it's on the go or whatever, it's an easy thing to eat, but um, and then my wife cooks beautiful meals at home too, but highly, appro highly approve it too late. And then I'm disrupting our dinner. So, but it's, there you go. It was delicious. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. I wish I could tell you a good Mexican place in Mammoth. I'm sure there's a great one down there. Somewhere. Oh yeah. But, uh, all right. Last question. Uh, uh, favorite gear item. Like everybody who does outdoor recreation or any type of work, we always have a gear item that we can like, never leave home without. Right. My what's what's your favorite piece of gear? That's a good one. Um, you know, favorite gear. It's probably, ah, here you go. Um, it's, it's a winter based item for us okay. because we actually dive year, year round. And so, um, we're, we're out there kind of any, you know, five degree weather sometime just in dry suits and things. And we have these things called dry robes. And so they're like windproof, but on the inside, they're just fuzzy. And oh. when we're, when you're scooting 15 miles across Lake Tahoe and it's, you know, single digit temperatures are always under, always under 30 degree, always yep. freezing, you know, below freezing, being able to kind of just put the hood on and it's like totally windproof and you're just in this little like cubby hole of warmth. Um, that's beautiful, nice. whether it's before or after the dive, it just keeps you warm and, uh, and diving year round in, in Tahoe. And so that's uh, that's probably the, the favorite gear item. And I know most of our volunteers that have that have jumped in the uh, frigid temperatures of Tahoe in say January, they they know the dry robes and they love them too. <laughs> dry robe, there you go. I've, I've never even heard of a dry robe. So that's a fantastic piece of gear. If, I yeah, if you're out, up today, uh, so. if you're getting wet in any way, shape or form and, and cold, cold temperatures, uh, the dry robe's worth checking out. Could be surfing, could be, you know, cold water plunges, uh, they're, they're a beautiful piece of equipment to, to look at. I love it. I love it. Colin, thank you so much for today. Clean up the lake and, and everything as you're doing. We appreciate how you're making the Sierra clean for the next generation and, and, and our experiences that we get to go out there. So thank you very much for your planning and your forethought and your group that uh, volunteers. Please uh, tell them thank you from us. Uh, yes. For the readers out there, if you want to get involved, learn more, cleanupthelake.org. They've got a great organization. Their social media pages are active. You can find information on Instagram, Facebook, uh, constantly running on that. And uh, uh, 
Colin, I, I feel like you talk a lot more about outdoor. You've done a lot of different things and I'm glad that you ran into trouble in Belize and, and I brought that back to Sierra. It's really, it's really kind of cool. So thank you very much. So uh, if you're, if you're listening today uh, to our podcast, we thank you very much for being here. Like subscribe, share all that good stuff. We'd love, love your support that, that way. Uh, we love bringing people like Colin and, and the Sierra to you, but uh, ultimately we just hope the Sierra is within your view that you are planning a trip sometime soon that you can spread out, discover more, uh, and just uh, find your love in the mountains like we do. So have a great day wherever you're at, and we appreciate you joining the show today. All right, I think it's...